and welcome to the Victory Guard. Today, Roger Swain has some beautiful new tulips to show off. Roger will also be working in the perennial garden, and he'll be planting potatoes. Then we'll travel to Carefree, Arizona with Bob Smouse to visit a spectacular resort that's been beautifully landscaped with desert plants. Marion's along, too, to sample some of the remarkable southwestern cuisine, featuring chili peppers and prickly pear cactus. All that is just ahead, so please stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Peter's professional plant foods and potting soils for all your indoor and outdoor gardening needs. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. And by Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. Our show today begins with Roger Swain at the Suburban Garden. Well, welcome again to the Suburban Garden on a cold, rainy day, but there's one great thing that can be said about this weather. Any flower that's in bloom now is going to stay in bloom until things warm up. That hot spell we had earlier in the week, why some of the tulips came into bloom and lost their petals almost the same day. This kind of weather, it's the transplanter's dream. Just look at this European beach that we moved here from the other side of the lawn a month ago. It's certainly not complaining about the moisture and the cool temperatures. Well, these two pots of daffodils were ones that we forced indoors, had them all winter in the cold frame, then brought them in, brought them into bloom early, and they gave us weeks of pleasure. But now the flowers are spent, and rather than simply throwing them out, I'm going to indulge in a little Yankee frugality. Now, the pots of forest tulips that we had, they are already on the compost heap. But crocuses and hyacinths and narcissus, which is just the Latin name for daffodil, those can be planted outdoors, and they'll go on blooming year after year. There's really nothing to it. Simply a matter of digging a hole where you want the clump of daffodils to be. I see there's some red maple roots still in the soil here. This is where we took down a 75-year-old red maple that was, had such a hollow trunk that was in danger of falling over and squashing someone or someone's car. It's a matter of digging the hole, oh, eight or 10 inches deep. Don't worry about there being roots in the soil. One of the reasons that newly cleared land is so fertile is that you have all that organic matter already in the ground that's breaking down gradually. And I'm going to add a handful of balanced fertilizer down the bottom of the hole where the roots are going to be in the future. Mix that in well. Then it's simply a matter of taking the pot of daffodils, upending it, shaking it out. There. See that root system? There must be eight or ten bulbs in here. Grabbing it by the hair and plunking it down in there. Plant it an inch or two deeper than they were growing in the pot. And I'm going to backfill the soil around here. Press it down firmly with the toe of my boot. Just like planting individual daffodil bulbs. Only here, I'm going to have a clump. In a few weeks' time, this foliage is going to have died down. All the energy and nutrients in the leaves are going to go back into the bulbs. You won't even know it's here by midsummer. But next spring, there'll be fresh green shoots and a clump of daffodils here, year after year after year. Well, on the other side of the drive here in our main perennial bed, things are really off to a fine start. Nothing brings out the color better than a little bit of rain. Is there anything prettier than water droplets? the delicate leaves of columbine. And here we have a nice stand of narcissus. The trick with narcissus is not to let seeds form. This is the seed head here. And when that begins to swell up, that's the time to deadhead the blossom. Pick that off so the plant doesn't waste energy making seed, but puts that energy back into next year's bulb. About a month ago, oh, almost two months ago now, I covered this entire bed with a two to three inch layer of composted cow manure. 
There wasn't anything visible in the bed, really, just a few dead twigs from last year's plants. But the beauty of a coating of this composted cow manure is that one, slow release fertilizer, but even more than that, you get a lovely effect of the mulch and the organic matter. It shades the soil, keeps weed seeds from germinating, holds moisture, cuts down on our water bill. Really, I can't think of any better way to top dress a perennial bed than composted manure. But if you don't live near a stable or a dairy, you can always turn to leaf mold. Doesn't have to be particularly fine. Lay this on the bed, just like I did with a composted manure. If you don't have leaf mold, well, you can always use that Cadillac of top dressing straight compost. Don't worry about letting it through a fine screen. Just lay it down over the bed early in the spring. Well, in New England, it seems like either absolutely nothing has happened yet, or we're already behind. Just look at this clump of summer phlox. Oh, this is not the phlox. This is a pink hyacinth that's growing up in the middle of the phlox. But this is the clump of phlox. And summer phlox is probably one of the most valuable bridge plants in the perennial border. There's nothing much in bloom in late July and early August, except summer phlox. Great trusses of pink and purple and white in a variety of colors. It's one Achilles heel, however, and that is a disease called mildew. And mildew appears as a white coating on the surface of leaves in midsummer, and shortly thereafter, all the leaves fall off, and a plant without its leaves is not going to grow very well. Well, rather than spraying this clump with fungicide every week all summer long to prevent the mildew from showing up, I've got a much simpler trick. Just watch this as I break off a great many of these stems. Hey, well, look at this. It's quite a change. Out of 50 or 60 original stems, I've left a scant dozen. But this will allow the foliage to dry off quickly after rains. There's good air circulation, the best way to deal with any disease problem. And I've not reduced the bloom, because the plant will put its energy into a few very large trusses. Now, spring is a good time for another chore, and that's edging the beds. In some of those great gardens that we visited, there have been fancy borders of cut stone or steel, but those aren't within everybody's price budget. And we find that a simple ditch is a perfectly adequate way of keeping grass out of the garden. But during the winter, rain washes soil down in and fills the ditch, and every spring, I cut back the edge with a sharp spade, lifting it up forward like that, shaking out the sods, and leaving a good, clean gulf. And the roots cannot grow into air, and so the grass stays on this side where I want it. Well, I'd sure rather be doing this when it was 48 degrees than when it was 84, which, given New England, could be later today. Well. I think even the Prince of Wales would approve of that border. And something else he might like is this serpentine of orange and yellow spring bulbs. The orange is the classic orange emperor tulip. I love the way the water is beaded there on the petals. And next to it, one of my favorites, this double daffodil called Tahiti. That's something. Fringed elegance is the name of this cream tulip, probably because of the slight ruffle to the edge of the petal. And that looks very nice up against the pale greenish yellow of the Andromeda shoots and their white flowers. But for some real color, let me show you Donna Bella. Any planting of flowers beside a pool of still water doubles your return. Not only do you get the blooms themselves, but their mirror image in the still surface of water. Well, this planting of daffodils and tulips alongside the pool is dramatic enough. But the one I brought you over to see is a species tulip, Tulipa grigii. Variety name is Donabella. And I like it because of the striking coloration of the foliage, this blend of a maroon net and a green background. And more than one flower per stem. And look at the flower itself that lovely splash of pink and cream. Growing up among it, I've got the old foliage of Iris reticulata that bloomed much earlier. 
I think it makes a lovely bouquet. Well, one of the things that I promised to do today was plant potatoes. So come on into the vegetable garden. A lot of people will say that potatoes are so cheap in the supermarket that it just doesn't make any sense to give them space in the home garden. Well, that's the sort of comment you can expect from someone who's eaten just too many french fries. The fact of the matter is that anybody who's grown their own potatoes and harvested them and cooked them lightly knows that the flavor is incomparable. And so I've given this entire bed over to potatoes, dug a six inch deep trench running the whole length of the bed, and I've laid out a double row of seed pieces. At the far end, I've got a potato called yellow fin. It's a yellow flesh potato. And at this end, a rather unusual potato that's thumb shaped and almost thumb sized. It's called Norwegian. It's a red skin potato. And despite its unusual shape, it has essentially the same layout. Here are the eyes, the young buds. And it's simply a matter of cutting the potato into sections, leaving at least two eyes per section. Then I like to dust the cut surface in a fungicide. This is powdered sulfur. And set the pieces a foot apart. Down the middle, I have a band of balanced fertilizer. Now I'm simply going to cover the seed pieces with two or three inches of soil, and they'll be off to a good start. Well, while the pure work ethic is alive and well here in New England, my colleague Bob Smouse has managed to make its way to the top of a mountaintop in Carefree, Arizona. Well, I hope you brought your hiking boots and your canteen, because we've got a great adventure here. We're in Arizona, in the uppermost reaches of the Sonoran Desert, which stretches miles in that direction. It begins in Mexico, and it essentially ends on these hills over here, here that are called the Tonto Hills. Now, this remarkable collection of boulders were not put here by anybody, and hopefully they're not going anywhere. But you can understand how they got here if you think of them as a pile of ice cubes that millions of years ago were fractured into these kind of cube shapes and now are rounded from the constant melting action of wind and rain. But this is just the jewel here. Surrounding it is a gorgeous setting of high Sonoran desert plants. Come with me back down the trail and let's look at some of them. It's hard to imagine a plant with more natural appeal than the saguaro cactus. It's a symbol of the desert, but it is actually the signature plant of the Sonora Desert. And I'm happy to report that it and all desert plants are finally getting some much deserved attention. Too many people have tried to bring their gardens from the east and midwest to the desert. Great big lawns, big shade trees, flower beds, those things just don't play here. This is the desert. They only get maybe eight inches of rain a year, and it's bloody hot in summer. But more important, they're missing out on the natural beauty that's all around them. These gorgeous plants should be in gardens, not just in the wild. Ah, look at that. There's some of those ice cube-like boulders. I wonder how much longer they'll be here. They look precarious to me. Here's my favorite part of the trail. Look at these boulders. They make a cool little grotto here out of the hot desert sun. Feels good. But look at the size of these things. Some of these are the size of houses and, and how precariously balanced they are. I guess it's a good thing we're in an area of low seismic activity. Now, if you are lucky enough to book a room here at the Boulders, I'd ask for room number 200. This is it right over here. It's situated under what has to be the most beautiful of these granite outcroppings. Now, even though these buildings are only five years old, what I like about them is that the color, form, and texture remind me of Adobe Southwest architecture that's centuries old. The horticultural trick here is to blend all of this, these new buildings, into an existing desert landscape. That task was given to horticulturalist Dave Hutchinson, who's right over here. Well, let's see if we can pry Dave loose from his gardening here and find out a little bit more about how they did such a nice job of blending man-made landscape with the natural desert. 
Hi, Bob. How are you? Hi, Dave. Well, listen, after they built all these little casitas, the land must have been traumatized. What did you guys do? Well, we were faced with a situation that uh, uh, we had to come back into an area that had been scraped and uh, really get it to look the way it did in, in, you know, in a natural sense. And, of course, that entails a lot of uh, adjusting densities and all sorts of things. Oh, density, that's an interesting idea, you know, getting everything spaced the right distance apart, because the desert has its own look, doesn't it? It really does. Now, what about this area? Well, this is an area that was protected when construction was going on. What do you mean by protected? Well, we, we try to establish protection zones, and doing that, we uh, cordon off the area, and then we put price tags literally on plants. Uh, a good example would be this Palo Verde. We'd put a price tag on it, and uh, a contractor would be less inclined to back into this plant, being that he may be fined heavily if uh, damaging That's a pretty, it. That's a pretty good enticement to leave the plants alone, I guess. And what about this saguaro? Has it always been here? Well, the saguaro, we felt, uh, would do real well here and, and add to the, the natural area. This one was actually brought in and planted. So you've augmented these natural areas, too? In a few areas we have. Huh. It's a beautiful thing. Tell me something about the other plants that you're using here on the site. Well, uh, a lot of the plants um, tend to act as, uh, 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 you know, achieving those densities that we were talking about earlier. And uh, the burst sage is a very common one. It uh, not only helps in that sense, but it also provides a nurse situation for many of the cactus. Oh, you can see that. this little hedgehog under here that's getting a nice foothold because of the protection of the, the burst great. sage. Yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty much a ubiquitous shrub on the property, isn't it? It really is. What about some of the native trees that you've used? Well, the trees are really the foundation uh, to the landscape. Uh, we use um, a lot of the Palo Verdes. This particular one is the Foothill Palo Verde. Uh, some people call it Little Leaf Palo Verde. It's beautiful with that green trunk. Mm -hmm. And you got plenty of cactus. How about this guy? Well, the prickly pear is one that we don't have a whole lot of on property, but it is very dramatic. Yeah, I'll say. Member of the Opuntia genus. You know, Opuntias are very uh, varied plants, aren't they? Isn't they this are. This is one too, right? Well totally represented different. in our desert. This particular one is the staghorn choya, which is a little bit more dangerous than the prickly pear. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd stay away from that. Uh -huh. You know, Dave, I, I just can't get over how nice a job has been done here between you know blending the, the boulders with the architecture blending the native plants with the things you guys have planted but i'm kind of curious what's involved with maintenance well contrary to the guest beliefs even though we do have a a very natural setting there is a lot of cultural practices we uh are involved with uh, selective pruning is a big one uh, we do a lot of fertilizing at proper times of the year, and of course we have our hands full with invasive type weeds also. <laughs> weeds even in the desert, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, here's a beautiful thing. Acatillo. Yeah, the Acatillo is uh, actually not a cactus at all, but like the, the Palo Verde, it's drought deciduous. Has the ability to drop and put on leaves as a response to heat and moisture and you can see this one's very happy right yeah now. just just rained and it's all leafed out mm -hmm. mm, you're growing some wildflowers too oh yeah the uh, the wildflower season has just begun and uh, this is the desert marigold mm. typical yellow bloom in the desert now do you plant those from seed uh, we try to harvest as many seeds as we can and really get the uh, wildflower program going and continuing well, is the golden rule here only use native plants? No, we actually use a lot of non-natives that come from other arid parts of the world. A good example is this acacia here. This is a native to Australia and does um, real well here. It's the shoestring acacia, yeah. acacia stenophila. What a graceful thing. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Here's another plant that I love. Full flower right now, cassia. Yeah, the feathery cassia is a... We have native cassias also, but this one, like you said, is from Australia. Well, it's sure pretty, and it, you know, it looks, looks appropriate to me with its gray leaves and yellow flowers in the middle of winter. Uh-huh. And what about this area over here? Is this, uh, this revegetated or man-made or well, preserved? Well, this, uh, this is an area that we actually 
took a, a, a bad situation and tried to work on it and turn it into a real positive one. Uh, the area acts as a drainage for a lot of the area uh, above here, and um, we've just kind of played on that and tried to work it into a small riparian situation by adding some of the, the plants that do real well in a little bit of a moisture situation. Yeah, it's really pretty. It looks totally believable as a natural area. And what about some of the larger cactus on the grounds? Uh, were these saved, or are you... Uh, Sneaking out in the desert and digging them up? <laughs> well, we, uh, we've got a good example of how we get these plants down at our nursery. Well, let's go see. Well, this is the nursery that I was telling you about, Bob, where we heal in small specimen cactus. Well, they were quite impressive, though. Where did these come from? These particular cactus came from a project west of here where they're building a large dam, and unless we were to go out and get them, they would have been destroyed. And we've got the proper tags in place. And That's what this is, a permit, huh? Yeah, we get those from the state, and they cost $2 a piece. Well, that's pretty nice. $2, and you save one of these from the bulldozers. Right. That's great. Well, you know, I'm really impressed with what you've done here. And thank you for the tour. Well, thank you. Well, after an invigorating day, tramping around this granite landscape and enjoying all these wonderful desert plants, you should be ready to sit down and enjoy a proper southwestern meal, which, interestingly enough, features many of the same plants we've been looking at, as Chef Marion found out earlier today. Welcome to the Palo Verde Room, a wonderful warm dining room with a distinctly southwestern atmosphere. You're not going to find a New England boiled dinner on this menu, but if you like peppers and chilies and tomatillos you've come to the right place and here's the executive chef chuck wiley hi chuck hi mary that's beautiful i wanted to show you some of the ingredients that we use for our southwestern cuisine here at the boulders we have the usual items the ripe red tomatoes and the avocados but we have some very unique things like nopal cactus mm. dried ancho chilies tomatillos and prickly pear well, you know, we get prickly pear back east, but I just don't know what to do with it. What do you do with it? They're wonderful. We make a butter with it that we serve on our blue corn pancakes at breakfast. Oh, it's beautiful looking. And you've got some nice southwestern dried ingredients there, too. Well, this is our blue corn meal from New Mexico. Yeah. Pumpkin seeds, which we toast, and as you see, we'll make a wonderful sauce for our chicken with it. Uh, black beans and annatto seeds. I don't know annatto seeds. What are they? They come from an annatto tree. Yeah. They're quite fragrant. We grind them up and make a paste called a chote, Ooh, yeah. and we baste our pork our, and lamb and seafood with it. have a wonderful aroma. You've got some great things on your menu, and this has got to be your pizza. Yes, it is. We make it with a cornmeal crust and a cilantro pesto. Not a basil pesto. No, it looks very similar, and it's made very in the same way. Well, he's got the pine nuts, and you've got garlic, and you've got Parmesan cheese. Only we use cilantro instead of the basil. So you get that earthy, grassy flavor. Exactly. It's a taste you either love or hate. <laughs> okay, now there's another thing here. It's got your grilled breast of chicken. Is it quinoa and pippian sauce? Uh -huh. What are those items? I'm making one right now. Come on back and I'll show you. Boy, I'd sure like to work in this kitchen. You could always use the help. <laughs> Here's the finished dish. Ah, there's the chicken. But what is this? That's the quinoa. Mm. This is how we buy it. And it's a millet-like grain. It's very high in protein. Well, how do you cook it? Like rice or something? Exactly. Yeah. And here we fashioned it into a little gratin mm -hmm. layered with butternut squash and pepper jack cheese. Mm. Now, what's this? That's the pumpkin seed sauce. I want to see what goes into that. Okay. First, we grind the pumpkin seeds with chilies. Mm. And then we add jalapenos, garlic, romaine lettuce, mm. and tomatillos. And then you make it into a little sauce over here. Uh-huh. It's wonderful. Well, now, Chef, I have to ask you, what do you do with the cactus? Whatever you do with it, do it carefully. Because <laughs> they're very spiny. Use a towel to pick them up. Uh-huh. Got to be real careful, and, huh? Exactly. They'll stick in your finger. Peel it and make sure all the ribs are off of it. Well, what's the point of using it in the first place? It's got the same characteristics as okra, mm -hmm. whereas it's very mucilaginous. Ah. See, once it's all peeled... Yeah, then what? Then I'll cut it up. Uh-huh. And use it to thicken my bouillabaisse. Oh, how nice. Bouillabaisse. Boy, I'd like to see a finished dish. That can be arranged. Ooh, 
that smells so good, and look at you've garnished it with the cactus. Well, now, what's in research and development? What's coming up? Mark, let's show her the huila coche. Huila coche? What's that? It's a black fungus that grows on corn. And if you were a corn farmer, it would be a disaster because it would wipe out your crop. It looks disgusting. What on earth do you want it for? Well, now it's thought of as an exotic ingredient that goes for $9 a pound. And it's got a wonderful earthy flavor similar to truffles. Well, I'll tell you what, Chuck. I'm going to let you perfect that, and I'm going to work on this. Bon appetit, Marion. Thanks. Well, Marion, I never thought we'd be giving Smut a good name on the Victory Garden. I think I'll pass on that. Well, that's our show for today, folks. And thanks for being with us. And please come back next week when we visit the North Carolina State University Arboretum. Until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Osmocote time-release plant foods for all your outdoor and indoor plants. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. And by Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. Now, home improvement is easy with helpful hints from Dean Johnson and Joanne Liebler. With useful decorating tips to advice for the dedicated do-it-yourselfers, spend some time with the hosts of Home Time, next on KCET. Garden, a book by Bob Thompson featuring tips and techniques learned over the 12-year history of the Victory Garden is now available. Taking you month by month through the growing season, this comprehensive step-by-step -step guide includes tips on soil preparation, seed starting, bug control, and more. Priced at $19.95 plus handling, the softcover edition can be ordered by calling 1-800-441-3000. Credit cards accepted. Also available in bookstores. Tonight, 